So this will be our fourth lecture on the production possibilities model. So let's do a quick review of what we learned in the previous lecture. Here we've graphed the five points of our model A through E. So anywhere along the curve, we're achieving full employment. And for the time being, the curve represents the best we can do. In other words, we can't get beyond the curve. The curve represents our economic limitations, our potential economic output if we're achieving full employment, if we're using all of our available resources. So for the time, for the time being, we have fixed resources in quantity and quality, fixed technology, and of course, we're talking about a trade-off of two goods here, pizzas being consumer goods and the robots being capital goods. What about this yellow area that's labeled attainable but inefficient? Well, anywhere inside the curve represents inefficiency or underemployment of economic resources, right? So unemployment or underemployment of economic resources. So inside the curve means we could be doing better. We could be having more pizzas and more robots. Society should be churning out more economic output. Unfortunately, it is not. Typically, this is associated with a, with a recession in the macroeconomic sense. Right? It's May of 2012 currently, and the unemployment rate in the United States is approximately 8.2%. And that probably underestimates the millions of people who are looking, or at least hundreds of thousands of people who have given up looking for jobs. So anywhere inside the curve represents attainable but inefficient. And typically, the resource that's unemployed or underemployed is labor. Where, you know, there, there are people, men and women, standing on the sidelines who are willing and able to work, who simply cannot find a job at present. So we, we would be doing better. So if we recovered from a recession, it would be a movement from inside the curve back towards the curve. Well, what about outside the curve? What about point W? Well, that says unattainable. So W is desirable because, look, at, you know, we'd be producing more consumer goods and capital goods. We'd, we'd be beyond our production possibility frontier. But for the moment, it's unattainable. Well, it's unattainable because... We have limited resources in quantity and quality, and we have, we have fixed technology. So are there are three ways to achieve what we refer to here as economic growth. So to achieve a point outside your curve would, would, would represent economic growth. There are three ways to, to get sort of to that point. The first one is to relax the assumption about fixed resources in quantity and quality. So if we discover more natural gas, if you know we, we come up with better solar panels, if somehow we, uh, you know, we, 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 we have more efficient, uh, you know, wind power and you know an improvement in one of our resources. This would be, this would this would allow us to achieve economic growth. If we had more people here working, so more labor, that would it, that that would it be one cause of economic growth. The next one is improvement in technology. Now some of these are you know a little bit overlap between technology and, and resources, but let's say you know we we came up with a new and better computer system for analyzing delivery systems or we came up with a, you know, a, a better way to crank out machines out of a factory. Improvements in technology are important. As a matter of fact, increases in technology typically account for or, or cause two-thirds of all economic growth. So in other words, over the last 50 or 60 years in the United States, increases in productivity slash technology have been much more important for our economic growth. There is a third manner of achieving economic growth and that would be through what's called specialization and trade. So in other words, if we specialize in producing goods and services where we have what's called a comparative advantage and trade with other nations, we could also achieve economic growth. Right? All right now, what about that point of allocative efficiency we were talking about earlier? All right, so theoretically, we could choose anywhere on the curve. But we wouldn't choose A or E because that would represent all consumer goods or all capital goods. And we, we definitely need a mix of consumer goods and capital goods. Now, two societies with highly similar populations, highly similar education levels, highly similar economic resources, they might choose completely different choices for allocative efficiency. So again, this is a normative decision, right? Societies will weigh based on, on society's uh, desired benefits and costs and on, on preferences within the society, the marginal benefits and marginal cost of additional units. So let's look at what's called the marginal benefits and marginal cost curve. So here we have graphed on the horizontal axis quantity. Right? In, this, in this case, it's quantity of pizzas. And on the vertical axis, we have price, or uh, measured in, in dollar terms, of marginal benefits and marginal cost. So the marginal benefit of another unit of pizza, or, or, or any units of pizza for that matter, Look what happens initially. At one unit of pizza, 
the marginal benefit is quite high. So one unit of consumer goods, because remember, con pizzas represent all consumer goods. So initially, as we're allocating economic resources towards the production of towards con consumer goods, the utility, the happiness, the satisfaction, the benefit associated with that is quite high. But then what happens is that marginal benefit declines with each successive unit of production because obviously, you know, as you consume more of a good, it typically provides less utility. We actually call this diminishing marginal utility, and that's associated with the uh, the marginal benefit curve. We're gonna, we're, we'll, we'll use that as one of our uh, determinants of demand later on in, in another chapter. So the second unit of pizzas yields or gives society only $10 worth of a benefit. And then, of course, look what happens at number three units of pizzas, at, at the third unit of pizzas. That means marginal benefit of the third unit is, is, is only five, right? Well, what about the marginal cost curve? Well, remember, every time we decide to produce a consumer good, we have to take resources away to potentially producing capital goods. So initially, as we produce one unit of pizzas, the marginal cost with the first unit of consumer good production, of pizza production, it's not that great. It's not that high. Right? It's only five. But little by little, as we shift economic resources away from producing capital goods and into consumer goods, marginal cost of producing consumer goods increases. So the marginal cost of the second unit of pizzas here is two. All right, and eventually the marginal cost of the third unit is three. And the reason, again, is because as we allocate more resources towards the production of consumer goods, those are less resources available for capital goods. Well, obviously here, X marks the spot, correct? So two units of pizzas, two units of consumer goods, would represent our marginal benefit equal marginal cost. Uh, you know, that's where we're happiest, right? Well, where is that on the curve, and, and what does this mean to society? So we're saying that two units is allocatively efficient for pizza. Well, let's bring our graph back up here, you know, quickly and talk about what that point that is on the curve. That happens to be point C on the curve. That happens to be point C on the curve, right? Now, how did I know that? Well, you know, we look at two units of pizzas. Well, how do we know that if we're producing two units of pizzas that it coincides with seven units of robots? Well, here's why. Remember, anywhere on the curve, we're achieving full employment. We're a a a achieving our potential economic output. Right? We're maximizing our productive capacity, so to speak. So if we use just enough resources to produce two units of pizzas, there will be exactly enough resources left over to produce seven units of robots, seven units of capital goods. Therefore, we will produce seven units of capital goods, and we will end up at point C. So for this society, point C is allocatively efficient. Now, could we have chosen point B or point D? Of course. Right? They're both on the curve, right? And they're both a combination of consumer goods and capital goods. As a matter of fact, in the next lecture, that's exactly what we're going we're gonna to discuss. So we bring up our, our point outside the curve, there, W, right? Economic growth in the future. Does our choice today, B, C, or D, will our allocatively efficient mix of society's uh, capital and consumer goods, will it have an impact on economic growth going forward? Well, that's the uh, story for the next lecture, and we'll, we'll see you in the next slides.